I hope you've done your homework. All of these women, every single last one of them is absolutely fabulous. And I definitely ask that you do your research on each and every one of them as I have. Um, we will start with uh, introductions. Uh, so from left to right on our panel is Lissy Leon Moreau. Am I saying that right? Yes. Um, and we have Tania Yuki of Sheriff Lee. Karina Carson, Cam Kishoni, Valerie Alexander, and Kendra Bracken Ferguson, and Janine Wolf. All right, ladies. I know it's early in the morning, I am still waking up myself, uh, but I am going to start off with the obvious question. You're all entrepreneurs. How in the world did you end up here? as entrepreneurs. So if anyone would like to start, go right into it. I, well, I was thinking about this, and I think I've been an entrepreneur since high school, but I didn't call myself that. And I still, I'm an entrepreneur, but I call myself more likely a producer. In school, uh, I was very smart and geeky, and so I like to organize things. I had the respect of people because I was a good student. And uh, I could get people to listen to me. And I could see straight through problems. And I could do things faster. And then what I discovered that I almost had to have is that I could do it my way. <laughs> so a, a lot of people take on the, the role of business. Uh, since being a teenager, there were a lot of rude lessons about becoming an entrepreneur. I, among other things, I convinced a friend of mine who had bought a big piece of land, and on it was the Ivan Torn studio, a big movie studio where they made the birds see honey. And he wouldn't sell the studio, and I knew he wouldn't sell it, because he was developing the whole area as a, as a apartment complex. So I called him up and said, look, I hate to see a studio just sitting there. Give it to me. I'll, I'll bring the studio back to life, give me office space, uh, let, me, let me run it. And he said there was one condition, he supported a nonprofit dance company, and they had to have the first floor free. Okay, so we rent the studio for the first time, and it's a Paul Newman Sally Field movie. And so everyone, oh, my life is so glamorous. Oh, Paul Newman, every day. you're gonna see Sally Field, all these other stars. And Maybe on the second day of filming, someone comes storming into my office and says, there is no toilet paper in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I hope this wasn't sound good. And then the next day was someone saying, this air conditioning is leaking, it makes noise, it's dripping, and it's holding up, uh, you know, it's holding up production. So at that point I realized that uh, being an entrepreneur also meant a lot of housekeeping, a lot of following the FedEx bill and the messenger bill and the and all the all the details. So I learned quickly, and I'm sure you're all gonna say the same thing, to be an entrepreneur, to be a producer, what do you have to know about everything? Excellent. Thank you.
know it. And so it's really interesting when you find yourself running your own company, um, and to your point, I think it is, it's the people, it's the clients, it's the invoices, um, it's basically everything. But I think for me, taking the skills that I had while at an agency, I was also at Ralph Lauren, and bringing that into my company is really what propelled me to raise my hand and say, oh my gosh, I'm a bona fide entrepreneur, um, to accept it and embrace it. so over having to be the brand and he's like that is, that is ex he's like when you are what you do when you're a speaker an author whatever you do you are the brand and he said if, if you're not willing to accept that then go work for a law firm <laughs> and and i had to stop and say oh, okay i guess that is what i will have to do to succeed at this um and then then i realized that means i'm an entrepreneur um and so for me like i was a lawyer and investment banker all the corporate stuff showing up somewhere every week and at the end of the week getting a check, you're an entrepreneur. Um, and so that was the thing, I had to develop a lot of skills I didn't ever think I had to develop, like marketing and sales. And I, I gave a talk in San Antonio yesterday, I, or Monday, I, I did a lunch and learn for the staff of this university and then I did a talk in the evening for the students. And one of the professors who was in the lunch and learn came up to me and was like, you know, at no point did you mention any of your books. And professor and it just doesn't even occur to me. I'm like, well, they're already paying me to give this talk. Why should, and it's like, those are the kind of things that we just have to get good at, especially as women. We have to get good at saying, this is what I do. This is what I want you to pay me to do. There's a great, for anybody who doesn't go to Creative Mornings, Creative, sign up for Creative Mornings. It's these fantastic morning lectures that you can free coffee and donuts and they have good <laughs> lectures. And there's a fantastic Creative Mornings video called Fuck You, Pay Me. <laughs> and if you haven't watched that yet and you're an entrepreneur, go watch that. Because that is the one thing that as women we have to learn how to do. We have to learn how to sell ourselves and we have to learn how to sell ourselves for price that's of value and then we have to get that money. So, uh. <laughs> Awesome advice. <laughs> um, for me, it's been a long road of failure, to be honest. <laughs> it's been a development of resilience and um, just really understanding that it's not personal. <laughs> you really gotta have thick skin. I always say all I've ever done is fail, which means all I do is grow. So if you shift the way that you think about failure and see it as a form of growth, it actually feels that way and then you don't end up giving up and you don't end up stopping right before you can actually create something. My first company was a severe failure and I never knew I was gonna be an entrepreneur. I was uh, totally the fat kid, the bullied kid, like <laughs> the one that had no friends in school. So I never ever thought I would have the, excuse me, balls <laughs> to have my own company. Um, and my first company was a severe failure. What company was that? It was a document delivery portal for physicians and service providers before we had EMR. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, it was smart and all, but. business development at a streaming video company in 99. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. There you go. Great idea, a little ahead of its time. And I had no idea what I was doing, me or my co founder. Um, and it was two years, 200 grand, and three customers. So we had to pull the plug. And it was a really bad failure. And then uh, it was during the height of the economic crisis. So I couldn't find a job. <laughs> there was nothing out there. I had my MBA and it was like $30,000 a year secretarial jobs. Um, so we ended up creating, me and my business partner ended up starting the first co-working space in LA for technology startups and entrepreneurs, which actually became super successful and spawned this entire Silicon Beach and tech ecosystem, which is why they call me the Godfather guys. <laughs> um, and 
again, that was great and all, four years there, and when I filed for divorce from my ex-husband, who was my business partner, he fired me. <laughs> so once again, we're starting over, right? And it's a matter of like, get back up, get back up, get back up. The, the Chinese have a saying that says, fall seven times, stand up eight. That's what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So now I'm on to my third company. It's the first human accelerator. It's called CoExcel. And it's going really, really well. Our clients include entrepreneurs and executives and politicians. <laughs> and things are going awesome. So you just you can't give up. You just got, always got to believe in yourself. That's the biggest, biggest thing. Always, always, always believe in yourself. Some of them were right, some of them not, but um, you know, it, it just felt, I think the, the benefit of starting a company from scratch, um, you know, I think there was someone early, maybe it was um, Eugene who sort of mentioned you have to sort of know everything, um, and I think my experience has been really different where it's just this intensely humbling process of, you know, I, I came up through product management, um, so I understand our industry, I understand data, I understand how to build products. Um, so when you're, um, you know, you're sitting with your CFO and they're like, well, we should do GAP, what about GAP accounting? And you're like, oh, it's actually two A's. Like, let me just go Google that and see. Um, you know, people sort of go, oh, well, you're, you're the CEO. You must know, you must be able to weigh in on this. 
into that next phase. Because uh, you always realize it, like probably six months after everyone else realizes it. And they're like, why are you still doing this? You're like, I don't know, that's what we used to have to do. Um, but you don't anymore. It's like, why are you weighing in on how to order snacks? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, because I, <laughs> um, and, and realizing that, you know, even if you might do it with 10% more care than others, like, it just doesn't matter. You have to let it go. Um, and I think there's always that push-pull to hang on to the right things, to let go of the right things, and to sort of do that in the right order. Um, and it's it's just hard. You know, I think it, it, you have to be committed to learning um, and committed to realizing when something's a little off and recalibrating. Um, and knowing that the thing that got you to start the company, which is that you loved something and you wanted to go deeper into it, um, you'll get to do that like You're an entrepreneur, this is great, you get to work for yourself. You're like, yes, you get to choose which 20 hours a day you work. <laughs> it's like, no one can, can force me to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, I think I started doing this because I thought it'd be fun, and I think it mostly is. <laughs> nice. Cool. So um, I think my story encompasses a piece from every one of you. Um, I, I started my career in the, in the movie studio business in marketing. And um, the first movie I worked on was Shrek at DreamWorks. And when I was working on that movie, I thought to myself, well, um, I want to be the person making the poster and the movie trailer and the creative stuff that I would see that I was managing on the internal side as a producer. And I thought I could do it better. I don't really like the politics in the movie business, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave and see uh, what I can do. And as you were saying earlier, um, Pam, I definitely was an entrepreneur by accident. Um, I left my job, it was right before I was about to turn 30, I went through a really weird phase in my life, and I was in, when I left, the studios that I worked for started calling me for work. And they were like, we can't do this without Lissy. So with that, I took that and I started a, a graphic design company focusing primarily at the time on flash like experiences that you would build um, on the web. So um, I worked on the Twilight series and I launched a huge like web experience for um, Summit at the time. And from there, it just kind of grew on accident. I was the CFO, I was the CEO, I was the girl that ordered snacks because I couldn't, I felt bad asking my assistant to do it because when I was an assistant, I hated being asked to do those things. So had a really hard time letting go of, of that stuff, as you were saying, lots of hats. Um, and then I did that for seven years and after a while, it was just time, I needed an ex exit plan. So I ended up, um, it became acquired by an agency very similar to the one I'm working at now. So when I got asked to come work at Ignition, it was sort of, they wanted me to do what I did at my company at this bigger company. So again, I left being an entrepreneur and I became an entrepreneur in a bigger company doing the same sort of thing, but bringing all the stuff that I'd learned from my company, working at the studios, being a freelancer and producer, and just kind of bringing it all together. And now I head up this department at an ad agency and I like to say I still have the same kind of ethic and things I learned along the way without becoming the person like I never wanted to be when I was working at like the big studios. So. Thank you. No, it's interesting listening to all of you. I didn't realize at the time that some of you really started from a corporate background and then discovered entrepreneurship and then went back. So do you think there's a difference between starting out as an entrepreneur from the beginning, starting out from scratch from the beginning, and having the structure of a corporation working for someone? I think it's either in you or it isn't. Um, this might cause some debate. Um, but I think you're either, I have this concept about, and I, I don't know if it matters whether you're in a corporation or um, starting your own business, I have this concept about people who come with their batteries included, um, and then people who just like show up and want to do good stuff, and maybe they want to start a company, or maybe they just want to do a really great job working for you, but they're creative, they're energized, and you don't have to light them up. Um, and then there's people who do not come with their batteries included, and you're always <laughs> running around trying to charge them up, and they get a little bit of charge in them, and then you turn your head and it's like, oh, they're flat again. Um, and I personally think, I mean, maybe you can nurture that, maybe you can kindle that more, but um, I, I have a theory that you either want to do stuff autonomously that's the best in the world and you can't rest unless it's excellent or you're just not wired that way. And I think if you're just not wired that way, I don't know that it matters. I totally agree with 
with what you're saying, coming from corporate, there was just something about it. I loved what I learned there. I think I learned it was a really good training ground. You have you learn to have thick skin. You learn how to you know how to work really hard all hours of the day. But you also learn what you don't want to do. So like when I started my company, I made sure I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. But these are great things I learned that I need to do.
uh, I was doing the first uh, tour of the governor's mansion in the state of Florida, and then two weeks later, by coincidence, because I would started out wanting to be an actress, I played Reginald Van Gleason, that's Jackie Gleason's French maid, on a Jackie Gleason special. <laughs> so, you know, you just took opportunities. But there's one thing, I, I now do a lot of media training, and there's one thing that I notice that we concentrate on mistakes, and I am really boring on this subject because I'm very repetitive on this subject. Yes, we were brought up as a culture to learn from our mistakes, and we're all very good at that. We're, you know, you, you, talk to, you talk to Nicole Kidman, and she tells you, oh, that one scene, I, you know, I didn't like. You talk to Tom Cruise, she'll tell you, you know, he'll tell you about the one mistake he made. And I keep saying to people, I, I don't play any sports, but I read a lot of sports sites. And the one thing that I learned is, yes, you face your mistakes and you learn from them. But you can learn a lot more if you train yourself to concentrate on your successes. So when Michael Jordan, <laughs> uh, you know, misses a basket, what, what he, and I'd ask at least what he told me is, you know, you go on to the next, but what you do, the coach does, what you do is you say, the time I made basket after basket, where were my feet? Where were my hands? What did I do that day? What did I eat that day? So I'm really on a crusade to get people, yes, to learn from and grow from your mistakes, but to really grow and give yourself credit for what you do right and learn from your successes. It is hard. We're a culture, you know, who likes to criticize. Kendra, I want you to finish with the picture and we'll come back. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that everyone said um, that really resonate. And I think that the main thing, too, even whenever you look at corporate or backgrounds or different experiences, um, there are people, which I believe, and, and I've been told, like, that I function at a higher capacity than others. Um, so there is this notion of some of this is innate. Like, some of us were going to be entrepreneurs whether we knew it or not our spirit was to go above and beyond, was to do more, was to finish a task and figure out what else I can do, was to, to dream and think differently than others, um, but we still need the people that we're having to recharge their batteries and help them because they're the ones that, um, like we, what we like to say in my company, um, teamwork makes the dream work, um, that, we, that we all need. And I think for me, it was my experience being at a big agency, a big holding company, and really figuring out, like, what is it that I like? Um, I knew I liked the social and digital. I hated billable hours. I was always on the utilization <laughs> report. But I was working harder than everybody else. And when I, it was time to start my own company, I was like, we're not doing billable hours. We need to work. We need to get things done. We're not going to charge our clients on an hourly rate because we're automatically going to go above and beyond. And what takes me an hour to do may take someone else three hours to do. And it's about our end result and end product. So it was taking all of that.
Now, it's funny that you say that because given the, the title of your book, you know, How Women Can Succeed in the Workplace Despite Having Female Brains, has that played a factor? Is it an issue of maybe age or is it really an issue of sex and ability? Uh, in tech, there is a combo of age and sex. Um, uh, age in tech is a really interesting. I was at y, the Y Combinator Startup School. I don't know how many people here know what Y Combinator is. Um, I was at the Y Combinator Startup School. I'll find out at the end of this week if I got into the next batch of Y Combinator. But um, I, I felt like everybody's mother. And I just decided to freaking own it. I was like, in my, in my video, I was like, I'm a Silicon Valley OG. I just met myself. I was working on deals before most of the people applying were born. Because there's no other way. Yeah, hang, if, if you can't hide it, hang a lantern on it. Um, but as far as our, the female brain, um, I brought, look, I learned. I brought a copy of my book. <laughs> so anybody's free to look at this if you want afterwards. But literally, this is about evolution and the fact that our brains evolved, literally evolved to function differently. We didn't have a prefrontal cortex before we began living in tribes. When we started living in tribes, we had to specialize by gender because the, the tribe couldn't afford to lose women. Also, going back to your story of your partners at the law firm, where you said it's more of a social thing, so business really takes place. I mean, as you see it, it takes place on the golf course, it takes place on the basketball course. You know, as you say, you were going home and everyone else was going out to play basketball. So, has that made a difference? I mean, really, in one, how you're perceived, and then two, um, maybe what they think your abilities are or opportunities don't really come to you because you're not really part of that club. Um, I, I want to actually let someone else can I, can I, yeah, 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 you can, can please do, because you <laughs> took on as the godmother so that you can teach that motherly role. Uh, so, I personally, I, I, mean, I, I have a little bit of a different thought evolution on this whole thing. Um, I really believe that it really just has to do with how you think. Everything's in your mind. I'm an immigrant, I'm a single mom, and I'm a woman in tech. And I'm super successful, right? Whatever that means to whatever it means to everybody. <laughs> but I always walked into a room and I just see humans. I don't see men, I don't see women, I don't see color, I don't see culture, I don't see anything else, I see human beings. And I really believe that when you walk into a room with that kind of a mindset, that nobody can mess with you. Because in the tech world especially, you'll hear a lot of stories about women that say that they can't raise money, about women that say that you know they're treated certain ways in the corporate world as well. I've never encountered anything like that. I don't know if I'm an anomaly or what it is. <laughs> But I really, I just, I don't, I really believe that women, we're really, really powerful. And we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. I'm definitely one of those for a very long time, no longer, which is why I do the work I do now, and I work predominantly with women. Um, 
We tend to put the power outside of ourselves in many, many situations. And we grow up thinking that this power within, if we don't have this power within us, our worth is dictated by whatever it is that's beyond us, be it our families, our relationships, our work, our titles, whatever it might be, and that's not true. The power's within us. So if you walk into a room and you own that room, and you look at everyone in the eye, and you say what you gotta say, and you say it with power, if anyone talks shit, that's their problem. <laughs> There's, I mean, who cares? There's always gonna be people that are gonna say things. There's always gonna be people that are gonna, you know, haters, haters gonna hate, as they say. But that's not anything, I don't know if we're opening up for questions yet. There's a hand up. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna take questions. Go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to see if we could dialogue a little bit on this panel because you have, you know, eight amazing women sitting of here. Course. And when you look through this, there are vast numbers of panels of 45 to 60 year old white men entirely having this conversation. Why did you agree to sit in this space and have this conversation versus fight to be out in that conversation? Well, I, I can actually answer that because I fought really hard last year after this panel. Okay. I, I, I told uh, the person who organizes this conference, I'm done with the vagina panels. I said, you know, it is time to make sure every other panel has women on it, and I was told by the organizer that's not my job. My job is to get the most qualified people for all the panels that we have. And um, we, and he's like, if I don't have women's panels, then I don't have women here. And I totally disagree with that. And I actually, this was a struggle for me to say, I'm, okay, I'm coming back and I'm doing another women's panel. Um, but I will also say, the content on the women's panels is really phenomenal. And that's what kind of changed for me last year. I had that fight with him after that panel, after that panel.
environment. So um, I think that it is a woman's time. We are about to have a female president, and um, we are um, not here to dominate the conversation, but be an equal part in the conversation and the leadership and business and every other um, uh, factor and sector of, of uh, life and business. And um, we, we are embracive and inclusive, and we want men to be at the table, but it's now time for us to have equal partnerships. So. Now, Lucy, I want to know what you think about this. Um, and yes, and, and Tamia as well, being um, one being head of digital and then being head of a company that is so tech heavy. You know, have you found any difference in how you're treated when people find out, oh, it's your company, or do you, are you noticing a difference? Does it not make a difference? Yeah, so I, I get this question a lot, like what is it like to be a female tech entrepreneur? And, and I kind of go like, I don't know what it's like to be a male tech entrepreneur. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, and I think it's very uncommon for women to solely
that when we look across the room, we're looking at people that look like us. And what I've experienced is it's not only the men, it's also the women. And when we talk about diversity in tech as an African-American woman, we're also, they think that if we have a white woman there, then like that's our status quo. So I'm also <laughs> approaching it from the perspective of being on this panel. Yes, I want to be on this panel. Not only am I saying, let's be part of something that does involve women whenever we're having a hard enough time getting in. Our victory is that this panel exists and there's other panel with women. And then for me personally, look around this room. There's three of us, four of us in the moderator. One of them um, is my business partner. So even when we look at the numbers of women, we're successful because we have this. I'm just happy that there's another female entrepreneur in here that I don't know. And this happens all the time. I spent the first part of my career walking into mistakes over the years by not being aware that all the battles aren't happening at that table, right. that there's, you know, <laughs> plotting other places, that there are ambitious people uh, that, that don't want the best for me, whether I'm a woman or because I'm a competitor. And I think that I'm, I'm very optimistic and try to be confident, but I can say that without scaring anyone off. You have to have your eyes open. You have to listen. You, you have to be attentive uh, to the signs uh, that you are on a battlefield, even though you thought you were, you know, coming in with a stretcher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I want to say a very quick thing, because brain science is the basis of all my research. I'm going to do a very quick thing on brain science. Um, our brains, again, from evolution, we naturally release cortisol, which is stress hormone when, when we experience something unexpected. So if you're in a hospital room and the doctor walks in and you were expecting it to be a man and it's a woman, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it, you, you have maybe the happiest thing ever, you're so excited, but your brain already released cortisol because it was the unexpected. Um, and uh, that process starts around age 16. Everything in our lives before that is unexpected because zero and 16 anyway, about 16 is when the brain sort of codifies that release of the hormone cortisol when we see, or cortisol when we something unexpected. So I want to make a point. That means that everyone below the age of 24 in this country has always had a black president, which means their brains don't release cortisol when the president is black. It's about to happen for at least the next four and hopefully the next eight years that their brain, it doesn't matter if you want to be racist, your brain is not going to cooperate because the expected is that your president is African American. And so the is diverse, where the expected is somebody who we haven't had in the past, the more our brains very quickly adapt to that, very quickly stop releasing that cortisol when, when we're encountering something. Again, it's a survival trait. If someone who wasn't in your tribe showed up, you had to be in fight or flight mode. And our brain
brain for that, you know, that's almost 20 million years of evolution that, that that happened. So, we, you know, it's hard to overcome. But now, like I said, we have an entire generation who's only ever had a president who was black. So it doesn't matter actually what they feel about that. It doesn't matter what they're being taught or trained about that. Their brains don't produce cortisol when they see that. And that those, those are the kinds of giant leap forwards in evolution that we can get by putting women in front. Like, I, I, I want to. I know some people at Legendary Pictures. Legendary Pictures has sent people to this conference. Every one of the people they've sent to speak at this conference is a man. They have women there. And the, organi the person who organized this conference, my talk, he said, I don't decide who goes on the panels. I tell the companies I'm putting together a panel. They send me people. So go back to every one of your companies. Look at every company who's listed in here and say, you didn't have any female executives you could have sent to Digital Hollywood? Call the companies. Say, I, I, there's another one of these in April. In April, Digital Hollywood, let's change it. Like, call CBS, call um, ABC, call everyone who has sent somebody here and say, call Machinima, who has, I think, almost zero female executives. Call Machinima and say, you know what? There's going to be a VR panel next year. You better have a woman representing your company there, or else I'm not sure I don't want to do business with your company. Well, I think that's um, And I want to, uh, I want to answer that question. Um, <laughs> I've sat on many panels here at Digital Hollywood, and when I was asked to moderate this, I thought, wonderful, and I saw the title, Women Entrepreneurs. I sort of resent that, I, I, me personally, I just sort of resent women this, women that, and yes, we do need to be a part of things, but I wouldn't have attended this panel, to be honest with you. I'm only here because I'm moderated. <laughs> and, that, and, and that sort of frightens me, because every single panel I've ever gone to in the past, let's be honest, it always becomes a woe is me, the men won't let us play in their sandbox. It's not about the work. And looking at all of the women on this panel, they're so diverse. They're so diverse, they all do very drastically different things. And I'm thinking to myself, did he just get the list and say, okay, I have all these women left and I'm just gonna throw them on here. And there's, there's my God, there's, there's seven of you. <laughs> you know, and you look at the other panels and there's four. So you have lots of time to talk, and there's so many of you that it's like, you guys are really gonna have to do your homework. You, you really are gonna have to do your homework. And I really want to bring it back to the work. And, and I think coming here, going to women's panel, in your mind, you kinda know what to expect. You kinda know you're gonna get, oh, what's the difference between men and women? You know, do you, do you feel more giving them exactly what you said they don't want, so shall we shift the conversation? Exactly! <laughs> you know, like, well, the title is women, so I have to ask the question. So let's disrupt. Okay. Yeah, let's disrupt it. So we have 20 minutes to not rob people of an hour and 15 of their lives, so how about we do it? <laughs> so just totally ignore the fact, um, you know, that, that we're women up here, and I really want to know did you go into this business to innovate or to disrupt? And to explain to the audience, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth on what disruption is compared to what innovation is. And the whole concept of disruption came from a Harvard business professor um, named Clayton Christensen. And he defines disruption as something that displaces existing markets, industries, or technologies and produces something new, more efficient, and more worthwhile. Whereas innovation is seen as something that only changes what already exists. So disruption is sort of like the square rectangle thing. So it's like a, a square can be a rectangle, but a rectangle cannot be square. So in order to disrupt you're completely changing something that exists on its head and making it something completely different. Um, and innovation is just doing what many of you have done and said, well, this isn't the way I would do this. And so you are more of an innovator. So for each one of you, what was it? What was your purpose? So, so Clayton Christensen makes the distinction between invention and innovation, which I think is an important thing. So invention is something that you do because you think it would be neat to create something and it's kind of just for you and maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. Innovation happens when people adopt it and it actually transforms their business, it's actually useful. Um, you know, I think having the goal of disruption is great, but to go out there just to disrupt is sort of boring, like it's not useful for people. I'm in the B2B space, I think it could be a little different for consumer. 
um, you know, I, I started the company because I wanted to build a product that would help people do their jobs better and help make meeting across new media better and, and get better optics into the dollars that they were spending. Uh, I think if you're not doing that to add value to your customers' lives, your business is going to be pretty short-lived. And I, I would say that um, neither one of those, um, I would say, has been a driver for Love TV. Uh, it's really been to make a positive impact, to make social impact, to really have a relevant, inclusive conversation about the most essential part of our lives, love, sex, and intimacy, which we don't talk about in a conscious way. We don't talk about in a way that fits the most complex time in human history in terms of relationship development and sustainability. So making a positive impact so that we can have a great conversation and have better relationship lives. That's what's that's what's driven me. So whether it's innovation or disruption, may it be all and may it do good. Um, personally, I'm uh, really, really pissed off at the way business is done. I really am. I hate the battlefield. I'm not a fan of it. I've never been. And I don't thrive in that environment and no one does. Like her, the whole cortisol thing. It's a battlefield out there and we're all in survival mode all the time. And None of us are thriving. None of us will really end up ultimately innovating if we're constantly feeling like our life is at stake. So my inspiration for my company, being a human accelerator, is the fact that there's a lack of humanity in business. And I want to change that. Now, I don't know if I can personally. I know that I need everybody on board. <laughs> it's not something one person can do by themselves, that's for sure. <coughs> But that's what inspired me, and that's, I guess, you can call it disruption, I don't know. I mean, I think that business should be human. I don't think that people should be treated as transactions. I don't think that people should be treated as numbers. I don't think that the economy, I always say the economy can thrive on a we dynamic, not a me dynamic. <clears throat> when we look at the world from a we angle, the possibilities completely shift. And everything, all of a sudden, is like bright and shiny and awesome and has depth at the same time. The whole me thing, which is what business is these days, isn't going to end up getting us anywhere. And honestly, the whole women-men conversation, this is where I say that women need to get together because it's up to us to speak up and bring that female energy as it is, the powerful energy that we have, not the chip on your shoulder, type of energy, <laughs> the real female energy that we have to create that yin yang, to create that balance in the business world. That's how I see us being able to really make a difference. But it's up to us to stand up, speak up, and to be our badass selves. So in shining that co-workspace, that was, I mean, many people see that as being very innovative and very disruptive to the status quo of how business was done. Right. So how did you come up with that? That, well, it, it honestly came from the previous failure, um, <laughs> being alone and working alone in a, I had an executive suite, and paying way too much for it, and nobody to talk to. I mean, we're energy beings. We have to be around humans. <laughs> And I didn't have anyone around, it was me and my co-founder, and it was super depressing, and honestly, I think that led to a big part of the failure as well. So it was, why can't we have a place for people like us, where it's like an AA for entrepreneurs, <laughs> where we can all fail together? Because <laughs> we're like a different breed in so many ways, right? So if that was the kind of idea that came from it, and it was built community first, profit second, and it broke even in four months, and it spawned LA Tech. We had the early Tinder team there, we had Full Screen come out of there, we had Instacart come out of there, we had Uber LA come out of there, we had over 1,800 alumni, over 600 startups. That was disruptive, yeah, but I didn't know it was gonna be. <laughs> well, it sounds you know? like yeah, that all of us said we, we became entrepreneurs without heading that way, and maybe we are disruptors because in the middle of doing whatever we do, whether it's for ourselves, I mean, my motivation was always to tell stories as a producer, a, a, as an on-air talent. But I, I, you have to take all these bits of things that you've learned and put them together, and that's how you create something new, and that's how you disrupt. You put things 
that other people wouldn't, you know, ingredients that other people wouldn't combine. I think, I don't like the idea of setting out to be a disruptor, though the word now has gotten overused yes. and you know, all mixed up in people's minds. But if you have something that you, if you have a mission, if you have something you have to do and you want to do, and you're creative and have some of the stuff on in you, it takes you forward. Right, and I see a common denominator with all of us is that you see what doesn't work, or no matter what your background is, you see what doesn't work, you allow yourself to fail. But then what was interesting that you said, Jeannie, was finding a mentor, finding someone, since you're, since you're creating something from scratch, from scratch that doesn't exist, how do you find, um, which is what my question was about the corporate world, how do you find the structure? Do you find it from a mentor? Do you find it from where you worked before? Do you find it from working with other people and creating a space where everyone's working together? How did each of you find that? I think for everyone it's different. I'm just going to answer this quickly. I'll give everyone else a chance. Um, for everyone it's different. The co-working environment, for example, having that community and empowerment stuff is awesome. It's great. It's good energy and all that. Personally, after having gone through a really hard time in my life, as I explained earlier with my whole divorce, leaving my company whole thing, um, I needed one-on-one. -on -one. I needed to have somebody that was with me, and I was lucky enough to have my, who's my business partner now. She's a globally renowned intuitive coach. She works with senators, CEOs, and she saw something in me. And this woman became my mentor, my best friend, and now my business partner. And together we created this thing that we have, this human accelerator, which is a three-month program one-on-one -on -one to really accelerate you through your work. We build leaders. And having that, the, cons, the reason why I bring that up is because it's about having access to the possibility of you being able to optimize yourself. And we are able to optimize ourselves with mentors, with the right tools, with the right type of you know, environments, coaching, or you know, whatever it is that brings out the best in you, but we can't do it alone. It's really, really important to have somebody there with you. It's important for all of us to realize that. And Lucy, is there a reason why? Because I noticed you're the only person that started out in corporate, then went to entrepreneurship, and then back to sort of more structured space. Was there a reason for that? How did that come about? Um, well, at the time I started my company, it was when um, everything on the internet, like I said, were these big sort of immersive flash website experiences, and my business partner that I had selected was an engineer, and we sort of capitalized on that. And so then everything changed. Um, flash went away, everything became HTML5, and it was either, okay, we have to completely change our business model and, and kind of start something else, or we sell. And I think at the time, so my business partner was, he had some other um, other ventures going on at the time, and I had some other ventures going on, so it just made, like, neither one of us wanted to do it alone. And to your point, like, you know, we had this amazing partnership for seven years. It just felt like, it felt like that made seven year itch, I guess. It felt like the right time to just sell, and so we did. And I didn't, I actually didn't plan on getting back into corporate. I, I had been approached to, to um, do things like a co-op co shared space as well and, and kind of start things like that. And um, you know, I was traveling in Spain and this little creative director that worked for me called me up and was like, I need you. And I was like, all right, I'll only do it for a year. I'll do it for one year and I'm out of there. And, um, and here I am, three years later, I'm still there. So it was just, I think it was by accident. I think the next step for me would be, I'm not gonna be here forever. Like I, I probably will start another
30 minutes, she called me back and I said, I want to manage bloggers. And she was like, oh my gosh, me too. We hit up a website that, that day, Saturday. We got our listings together Sunday. Monday, we filed for an LLC. I went into David Lauren and I was like, oh my God, we're going to manage bloggers. And he was like, okay. Because nobody knew at the time what it was. And we literally went to all of our friends and we said, we're going to manage you. And we scoured CAA and UTA and all of the sites, like figuring out how to be agents and how to be managers. And under this assumption that CAA was going to come and they were going to buy us and we were going to cash out. Um, and that's not what happened. But what happened was we created something and we changed the whole conversation around bloggers and around influencers. And we were going into brands and saying, let us show you. These are the people that are carrying the influence. They're going to help you with your message. And for a lot of them, like even like Ralph Lauren, I said to one, you have more traffic on your site than Ralph Lauren has coming to their site. Your value greater than this. So when we started looking at CAA and UTA, there became a point where they started trying to, to take off all of our talent and they were reaching out to our girls and they saw what we were doing. And I'll never forget, we went to Brillstein and we had a meeting with the president of Brillstein and he was like, you guys are going to win in the streets. You don't even know what you've created, but you've changed something. And he's like, stop worrying about all of the other players. Go out, you're going to win in the streets. So it was innovative, it was disruptive, it's now commonplace and all the brands are working with influencers, but at the time, I started from a place of, do you understand what your value is? You're coming to this global company saying something and you don't even understand the power that you hold. And that really changed the game for them and it changed the game for marketing in general, but it started with there's a need in a white space, there has to be some shift that has to happen with who's carrying the balance of influence for brands and who's helping brands to convert. Um, and so we kind of came at it from that place and not with the intent to innovate, but the intent to change something and to give life to a new voice and to a new thing. Well, ladies, we only have four minutes left. Um, so this will be the speed round. Uh, just for quick questions. Um, someone interviewed you, Lizzie, for I Want Her Job, and the question was, what piece of advice would you give to your 21-year-old self? And so, Lizzie, I'll start with you, and we'll just go right down the line. Um, well, I think it would be, um, don't be afraid of like what you think you can't do because you can still do it. Um, when I was 21, you know, I moved to Hollywood and thought like you could achieve. You, it's really hard to break door, you know, break through doors and. And really make something I'm sorry, yourself. just one sentence. We gotta get through oh, all of you in like three I would minutes. Say, like, don't be afraid, like you can do anything. Um, throw yourself into everything as fast as you can and don't worry about if it's right or not. Um, meet as many people that you can that are in the direction that you want to go. Mine would be um, invest in yourself, build yourself, and believe in yourself more than anything else. Being 100% honest, right now if I could talk to my 21 year old self, I would tell her put away more money, figure out how investments work, figure out how to maximize your investments and get a much, much bigger nest egg. When I look at how much money I've made in my life and how much I have now, and learn from my 21-year-old self because she believed she would call anybody. She didn't know uh, all the things that were up against her. She didn't know about gender, corporations. She just knew that everyone would take her call. Everyone would say yes. So I would say talk to your 21-year-old self, recapture that spirit. And I have one other motto, which is everybody says never give up. I say Never let them see you giving up, because we all give up from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a perfect closing. Thank you very much.